Uh, welcome everyone to, uh, to the School of Advanced International Studies at uh, Johns Hopkins University, SICE, uh, on, a, on, a, on a cold morning with snow in the offing. Uh, this is an important time to talk about uh, prospects for energy and the environment and we're very lucky to have with us Dr. Richard Newell, who is the seventh uh, administrator of the U.S. Uh, Energy Information uh, Administration. He is, um, has deep expertise in the topic that we're about to uh, have launched here, which is the annual energy outlook for 2011. Um, I'm going to embarrass him once again by saying that he's had a distinguished uh, career in academia. Uh, he is on leave, in fact, from his position as the Gendel uh, Professor of Energy and Environmental Economics at Duke University. And he, of course, he has served on the, uh, the Council of, uh, uh, he's a senior economist, in fact, in Energy and Environment of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. He has also been a, a distinguished uh, thought leader at the Resources for the Future. Uh, and he um, is, uh, he holds his doctorate in um, resource economics, environmental and resource economics from, from Harvard. Uh, so Richard is uh, both a true expert in this arena and is now in a very important position of providing, in fact, the data, the analyses, the, the, as objectively as you can possibly find so that good decisions can be made on the basis of what we are about to hear. So Richard, I'm going to let you do, do the rest of this presentation. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks very much, uh, David, for that kind introduction. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here at uh, Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies uh, to present the annual Energy Outlook uh, 2011 and to engage with you all, exchange ideas, and to be hosted by uh, the Energy and Resources and Environmental and Environment Program here. Uh, one of the things I should first mention is that uh, the work that I'll present today represents uh, 99.9% .9 of it, actually probably 99.99% of it, uh, the efforts not of myself but of uh, all the great staff at EIA that, that puts this work together and has built uh, the underlying uh, modeling approaches and collected the information over many years that, that support this type of analysis. Uh, while I'm here today to discuss the, the reference case, and I'll explain a bit more in a moment exactly what the reference case means. Uh, in the that's one particular case. In the spring, we'll be releasing the full annual energy outlook, which will include many different sensitivity cases uh, that vary uh, key assumptions, such as the price of oil, the outlook for economic growth, different technological assumptions for important energy using technologies, uh, and also a range of different uh, uh, looks at alternative possible policy futures where there might be uh, regulatory changes in the offing which may not, which would not be incorporated in the reference case if they're not current law. Uh, there, are, there is a significant degree of, of uncertainty in an outlook when you're looking out uh, 25 years into the future, as we all know. Uh, and so this is very important to keep in mind. I'll be presenting a lot of uh, figures today, uh, many of them with you know, a significant degree of uh, precision to them. And, but we need to keep in mind that uh, there is a significant degree of uncertainty as one looks into the future. Uh, we each year put out a retrospective look at past annual energy outlooks and compare them to what actually happened. Um, so that's available on our website. And uh, as a very general feature of that, what you tend to find is that uh, quantities such as uh, production, consumption, barrels of oil consumed, produce, uh, kilowatt hours of electricity uh, generated or sold uh, tend, to be, tend to be fairly uh, well uh, uh, projected in these outlooks. Uh, by comparison, um, prices, uh, which tend to be much more volatile and are much more difficult to predict, not just from the Energy Information Administration, but by any uh, forecaster, tend to uh, show a lot more variation as one looks into the past. So it's important to keep in mind. Uh, I'll, be sh I'll be showing you both historical data of uh, what recent history of the last couple decades has looked like, as well as uh, forecasts for the future. The last year of historical data in the outlook is for 2009. Now, 2009, as we know, was the low point in the recessionary period, not just in the U.S., but globally. And so uh, many of the growth uh, changes that you'll see from 2009 to the end of the outlook 
are inflated because you're starting at a low point. So that's important to keep in mind, particularly when comparing this year's outlook to last year's outlook. Uh, so for example, while overall energy consumption was down 7% from 2007 to 2009, some parts of the economy, uh, the energy economy, were disproportionately hit. Uh, coal was down 13% over this period. Petroleum was down 10% over this period. Industrial shipments, which are closely related to industrial energy consumption, were down 15% from 2007 to 2009. Um, so with this history in mind, let's turn to an overview of the key results. Let me see, make sure I can, there we go. Uh, first, uh, there's been many very significant uh, energy-related developments uh, in the natural gas industry, and those continue to occur. Uh, one of the things we'll see as we go into details of the outlook, we've updated this year's reference case with the latest shale gas resource estimates, and the change implied by this uh, change in assumption is large. Uh, relative to last year's outlook, we've nearly doubled the projection for shale gas production uh, by the end of the uh, projection. This leads to lower prices, it leads to higher natural gas consumption, but at the same time, the increase in domestic production is so high, it actually also leads to decreasing imports, which approach 1% by the end of the projection. Uh, second key uh, result is that along with electricity generation, industry is a key area where increased gas consumption occurs. Uh, this is supported both by the economic recovery as well as uh, lower projected natural gas prices. A third key result is that non-hydroelectric renewables and natural gas are the fastest growing uh, sources of uh, net electricity generation over the projection. Uh, nonetheless, coal <coughs> continues to be a dominant, uh, predominant uh, fuel source in electricity generation due to its large uh, role in existing capacity. Another key result in the outlook is that oil imports uh, decline uh, due to a combination of increased domestic production, both onshore as well as through biofuels production, um, and consumption growth that's moderated by uh, higher prices and by uh, fuel economy standards for automobiles. Um, as a re result, the net import share, not just of oil, but also of natural gas, when you look at the entire energy economy, the net import share of consumption, including oil, natural gas, and other fuels, falls from 24% in 2009 uh, to 18% by 2035. Uh, finally, uh, regarding the environment, one indicator that is often focused on is uh, energy-related carbon dioxide emissions. Um, they do grow slowly over the projection, uh, but they don't return to 2005 levels until the year 2027. By the end of the projection, they get up to about 6% above uh, 2005 levels. Now before I get into, I'm going to go through uh, all of this in, in much uh, greater detail. Before I do that, I want to cover a bit about the, the assumptions that underlie the uh, reference case, as well as some indication of some of the key updates we've made uh, to the model uh, over the last year and to our assumptions that, affect the, that do tend to affect the results. Um, first, what is included and excluded in developing uh, EIA's reference case projection? Um, First thing is that it's, uh, the reference case is carefully designed uh, in its handling of legislation, regulation, and technology in a, in a way that's meant to facilitate uh, a baseline against which one can measure potential changes to regulation and also to evaluate alternative technological assumptions. So it's a very well-defined case. Uh, the prevailing assumption in the reference case is that current laws and regulations will continue as they're currently written. Uh, for example, some of the things this implies is that where there is maybe existing policy, if in law it sunsets, such as the ethanol tax credits at the end of this year, or production tax credits for wind at the end of 2012, or uh, solar tax credits in 2016, they do in fact, in the outlook, sunset. Um, now, regulations may change, and once they do change, we would incorporate it in that outlook, but that's an important thing to keep in mind. Uh, in addition, potential future policies, such as uh, controls on greenhouse gas emissions beyond what is already in law, um, are not included in the outlook. Although, again, we do get requested by Congress and look at other sensitivity cases where these types of uh, provisions uh, are, are included. And so that's the kind of thing that you will see in our service reports and also uh, potentially in the annual energy outlook when the full one comes out. Um, as indicated here, there are some gray areas when one is uh, trying to uh, define a reference case, uh, but generally speaking, uh, it's current laws and regulations that are in there. Uh, likewise, on the technology side, 
uh, our assumptions about technology uh, represent technologies that, that are either commercially currently available or are likely to become commercially available in the next uh, decade or so. So it does not include revolutionary breakthrough technologies, but technology is not static in the model. There is a, what you could think of as learning by doing. As new technologies get deployed in the model, their cost does come down. There's significant improvements in energy efficiency. There's actually a, a very rich suite of technologies that are available in the model for adoption if, in fact, uh, market or regulatory drivers point the energy system in that direction. Some key updates to the uh, reference case this year. Uh, we've grouped these in three areas, natural gas and oil supply, electricity and transport. Um, as I've already mentioned on the oil and gas front, a key uh, change that we've made is updating our uh, estimates of the technically recoverable shale gas resource base. At the same time, we've also uh, reassessed uh, uh, oil shale uh, uh, reservoirs such as Bakken, the Eagle Ford, places where there has been increased development over the last several years. That's also been updated. Um, we've also included impacts of the offshore uh, drilling moratoria and changes in offshore leasing plans. Uh, we were able to get into the outlook, the changes that were announced on December 1st about uh, certain changes to the uh, 2012 to 2017 offshore leasing plans, which excluded certain areas that previously had been included. Um, in electricity, uh, EIA commissioned a significant study by uh, R.W. Beck and uh, SAIC to ensure that we have the most up-to-date uh, capital cost figures for electric power. Uh, so this does enter into the outlook. Um, we've also expanded the regional detail of our model uh, for electricity, which now has 22 regions instead of previously 13 regions. This will help us to better uh, represent uh, differences in market structure and power flows that may that were occurring at the sub-regional level relative to we were previously in the outlook. Uh, finally, on the transportation sector side, uh, we have in the model now an allowance for uh, blending up to 15% ethanol. Uh, EPA issued an ethanol waiver. Uh, there's, for uh, about half the states, uh, we allow for uh, E15, therefore, to penetrate uh, starting next year into the marketplace. It ramps up over time. There's about half the states where there's other regulatory uh, structures in place that would not currently allow for E15, and so at this point we do not allow that in the model, but E15 uh, does increase in, in the projection. Uh, we've also included the California's uh, low carbon fuel standard in there. Um, we've also revised our treatment of uh, vehicle miles traveled. One of the things that we've seen over the last several years is a greater degree of connection between things like the rate of unemployment and personal travel demand, and given the, particularly the effects of the recession and the uh, somewhat persistent uh, level of unemployment that we found that that is an important feature which we've incorporated into the model and it has affected uh, VMT looking forward. Uh, finally here we've updated our treatment of uh, electric vehicles, changed our electric and plug-in electric battery costs and size. Um, previously up until you know really very recently in fact, this is ongoing. Uh, you know, one of the few electric vehicles uh, offered in the United States was something like a Tesla, but now we have a number of other different kinds of models entering into the market. There's been significant inf uh, investment into uh, battery, battery manufacturing, and so we've uh, uh, expanded our treatment of electric vehicles in the model. So turning now uh, to the outlook, I want to start with one slide on global energy supply and demand just to, or consumption just to give you a sense of where the United States uh, fits in. Uh, given the, the interconnectedness of uh, energy markets and uh, energy to the broader global economy, uh, it's important to keep this uh, in context. Uh, the United States uh, currently consumes about one-fifth of the world's energy, uh, but this share is likely to decline <coughs> over time in the projection. So what we have here is energy consumption in quadrillion BTUs, which is a, a unit of energy uh, consumption that we use to kind of put everything in a, in a common denominator. It shows it growing over time. Uh, we expect global energy consumption to increase about 50% over the next uh, 25 years, uh, but the vast majority of this growth will occur in uh, developed, uh, developing non-OECD countries, whereas OECD countries uh, will grow much more slowly. Um, the 
Growth in non-OECD countries, we expect to be 80% over this period. Um, this will be particularly uh, strong in uh, China, India, the Middle East, and other emerging economies. Um, by the end of the projection, China accounts for 25% of global energy consumption, whereas the U.S. has declined to about 16%. Uh, with that backdrop, uh, let's turn to the U.S. energy outlook. I'll start with a broad overview. Uh, this slide here is actually a bit of history. It's kind of a snapshot of where we currently are, uh, 2009. As you can see, our current energy supply is 83% uh, from fossil fuels, and it's broadly distributed across the major sectors. Um, a, portfol a portfolio of energy supplies meets current U.S. energy demands. Uh, some sources of supply and demand are very closely linked, like petroleum and transportation or nuclear power and electricity. Others are much more dispersed, such as natural gas, which is spread uh, roughly evenly across uh, industry, residential commercial buildings, and electric power. This slide shows uh, kind of the big picture of energy consumption looking forward in the annual Energy Outlook 2011. Uh, you're going to see many slides that have this uh, basic form, so let me uh, talk about that for a moment. Uh, we've got, on, can we move that flag? That's great. Don't mess with the flag. All right. Uh, I think that's better. So. What this graph shows is we've got history, which is to the left. Then we've got 2009, we've got a line. That's the last date of historic data here. And then to the right of that is our projections, which go out to 2035, about 25 years into the future. Uh, this particular slide, again, is focused on primary energy consumption measures in quadrillion uh, British thermal units. Uh, what we see here also is the shares in 2009 of the major fuels in the energy system. And again, how those shares change by the time you get out to 2035. Um, U.S. primary energy consumption over this period from 2009 to 2035 rises by 20% uh, from the low levels of 2009, uh, but relative to 2007 levels, it's just 12%. So this is important to keep in mind that, that reduction that took place over those couple years from 2007 to 2009. Um, an average economic growth rate of about 2.7% per year underlies these projections population growth rate of about 0.9% uh, uh, and employment growth rate of about 0.7%. Uh, renewables meet a large share of the increased consumption and demand for energy, growing from about 8% share in 2009 to a 14% share in 2035. As we'll see in a moment, there's some key things driving this. There's state level renewable uh, electricity generation standards. There's the renewable uh, fuel standard for uh, blending of ethanol and other advanced biofuels into liquid fuels. Um, we see increased non-hydro renewable electricity consumption in the electric power sector will account for about 23% of the growth in electricity generation uh, over the projection period. Um, as a result of this uh, increase in renewables, the fossil fuel fossil share does decline from its current level of 83%, but is still 78%, the vast majority of energy consumption, even by the year 2035. Recall that this does not include any policy changes that may be considered in the future. Um, total U.S. consumption of liquid fuels, which includes oil, uh, other sorts of petroleum like natural gas liquids, it also includes biofuels, uh, grows by 14%, uh, which is slower than the overall rate of growth in the projection. Uh, coal consumption grows by 28% over the period, but only 7% from 2007 levels. Again, showing the significant decline in coal over the last couple years. Um, coal consumption in the electric power sector is lower than in last year's outlook due to both lower gas prices and also higher estimates for new coal power plant costs. Uh, natural gas consumption rises 16% over the projection period. Uh, this is primarily uh, growth in industry and for electric power generation. Um, and finally, nuclear uh, power grows by 10% over the projection period. This is due to the addition of about 6 gigawatts of new nuclear additional, additional nuclear capacity, as well as about 4 gigawatts of uprates in existing uh, nuclear generation capacity. Um, 
as we'll see as we go on, we, we are projecting now uh, assuming higher nuclear power plant costs than we had been in last year's outlook, again, due to uh, adjustments based on the report that I had mentioned earlier. This slide is showing uh, some of the effects of changes in the structure of the economy and energy efficiency in the outlook. Um, energy efficiency improvements are an important force that moderates uh, energy consumption in this outlook. However, declines in the energy intensity of the economy or energy use per unit of gross domestic product is what causes most of this change. Um, this is caused uh, by key factors such as a transition to a more service sector oriented economy away from a heavier industry. Since 1992, the energy intensity of the U.S. economy has declined by about 2.2% per year on average. Economic output of the service sector has grown almost six times faster than the growth in the energy intensive industrial sector. Uh, so you've got a bigger share of your economy which is less energy intensive. Um, the industrial share of total shipments in the U.S. economy has fallen from 31% in 1992 to 24% in 2009. We assume that a similar type of transition will continue to occur in the projections. Um, what this does is this results in reductions in uh, projected energy consumption in the outlook, which are about a third lower from where it otherwise would be if you assume the economy just maintained its current uh, structure. Um, in addition to that, efficiency improvements, which could think of things as changes in appliance efficiency, changes in uh, building shell efficiency, changes in the efficiency of automobiles, um, reduce energy consumption by a further 13% relative to where it otherwise would be. So as you can see, there's a, a significant amount of energy intensity of improvements that are assumed in the reference case outlook. Uh, this, this next figure, which we'll uh, show quickly, this is uh, indexed to the year 2005. So all of these uh, indices are equal to one in 2005. Um, it just reinforces the point that en while energy use has risen, it has risen uh, much less slowly than, than economic growth and other factors. Uh, we see energy intensity continuing to fall. Uh, it, we see it uh, falling throughout recent history and we see it continuing to fall in the projections. Uh, one additional factor you see here is CO2 per dollar of GDP or the carbon intensity of the economy. As you can see, the carbon intensity of the economy is also falling in the projection along with uh, the energy intensity of the economy because carbon dioxide uh, tends to be closely related to energy use. Um, the difference between those two lines you can think of as the carbon intensity of energy, which as you can see is falling by a bit but not by a lot. So this shows up in our uh, projections of energy related carbon dioxide emissions. Um, we saw CO2 levels, uh, CO2 emission levels uh, falling by 3% in 2008 in the United States. Uh, they declined by 7% in 2009, largely due to the recession. Uh, projected CO2 emissions in 2020 in the projections are still 3% below 2005 levels, and they don't again reach 2005 levels until the year 2027 in the outlook. Um, but by 2035, because there is slow growth here, uh, carbon dioxide emissions do get to about 6% above 2005 levels. This is measured here in billion metric tons of carbon dioxide. Now I'm going to turn to some more detailed results for electricity, then I'll turn to natural gas and finally uh, liquid fuels including petroleum and other liquids. Again a, uh, a backdrop slide showing you where we currently are in terms of the electricity generation mix. Um, in 2009, the most recent year of historical data, electricity generation was 70% from fossil fuels, 20% nuclear, and 10% renewables. Uh, coal remains the dominant fuel for electricity, but its share has uh, been under pressure as lower natural gas prices encourage an increased use of natural gas generation. We've definitely seen this over the last year or so. Um, in, two, in 2007, coal accounted for over 48% of total generation, but the recession coupled with a dramatic fall in natural gas prices had led to a significant switch in favor of natural gas over coal. Uh, coal generation fell 12% from 2007 to 2009. Um, conversely, natural gas and renewable generation shares were higher in 2009 than in previous years. So this is in uh, net generation, billion kilowatt hours, 
we've broken out the other renewables into a sidebar here uh, to, to kind of spell out exactly what role uh, those play. Turning now uh, to the projections, focusing first on the overall rate of electricity consumption growth, um, we're projecting electricity consumption growth on average of about 1% per year. Uh, this leads to about a 30% total growth in electricity consumption from 2009 to 2035. Uh, this is actually one of the fastest growing parts of the kind of large, uh, big picture energy mix, but it is significantly slower than it has been in the past. Uh, in the 1950s, electricity growth was rising about 10% per year. In the 1980s, about 3% per year. But it has slowed down considerably, and we're only assuming about 1% year growth uh, into the future. Uh, this reflects a continual structural shift in the economy toward a less energy-intensive economy, as well as higher prices and efficiency standards. There's recently been efficiency standards for lighting, air conditioning, clothes washers, and several other appliances in buildings, as well as changes in building codes. The electricity generation mix, which is what is uh, the, the key fuel sources for this increased electricity consumption growth, um, we're projecting will continue, gradually shift to lower carbon options, um, with generation from natural gas rising 37% over this period and renewables rising 73% over this period, both of which are less carbon intensive uh, clearly than coal. Uh, the share of all renewables and electricity increases from about a 10% share currently to 14%. Um, gas rises from a 23% share to a 25% share and coal and nuclear shares fall. This is in electricity net generation, again, a trillion kilowatt hours per year or thousands of <coughs> billions. Nuclear, as you can see, we, we add about uh, uh, six gigawatts of uh, new nuclear capacity, but as a share it falls because other sources of electricity generation are rising faster. This chart shows uh, some of the results from the recent study I mentioned where we've updated our electric power costs uh, to ensure that we've got the most up-to-date information underpinning our modeling results. Uh, we commissioned a study by SAIC and RW Beck to review and update our power plant cost assumptions. Um, the, the full report is on our website. If you can't find it, just send us an email. Um, this figure is for overnight capital costs. So this you can think of as the cost uh, per kilowatt of building a plant in one day, which is obviously uh, unrealistic in order to get the uh, fully loaded costs um, and to understand uh, you know, whether or not an actual plant would be constructed and then dispatched, there's a number of other factors that one needs to take into place. Uh, one is, first of all, the construction uh, timeframes, um, but also uh, fuel operating costs, utilization rates, environmental performance, intermittency of a particular source. Uh, so this is just one factor, uh, but it's a well-defined factor that we thought would be useful to share with you. Um, the costs for most of the technologies um, are higher than used in last year's outlook. The biggest increases are for large capital intensive sources of electricity such as uh, coal and nuclear plants. Um, coal rises, uh, pulverized coal plant, the cost uh, is 25% relative to last year's outlook and 37% higher uh, for nuclear. Um, natural gas was, was, was pretty constant. Wind uh, power rose a bit. And you can see that uh, solar was a little bit uh, of a standout in the sense that it declined from the assumptions in last year's outlook. Uh, the de decrease in the cost of PV uh, was due to assumptions about a larger plant capacity and uh, falling component costs. This slide, which is again uh, in net generation from non-hydropower renewable sources, billion kilowatt hours per year, uh, shows that wind and biomass uh, play the leading role in expansion of non-hydroelectric -hydro renewables in the outlook. Um, wind generation increases more than twofold, uh, but slows after an assumed uh, expiration of the production tax credit in 2012. In fact, you can see this quite clearly, well actually, can you see that? <laughs> Yellow, green. Um, so uh, you can see that there's a, a bit of a kink there at 2012. This is the assumed expiration of the wind production tax credit. Um, Biomass generation over this projection increases more than fourfold. Uh, this is mostly co-firing of biomass with coal. And um, it doesn't require most of it increased capacity. You can actually blend it in with existing coal. And this is primarily in the outer years uh, induced by 
continued state level renewable portfolio standards, uh, which are currently in law, and that's what's driving that. Uh, solar grows rapidly over this projection. It goes up nearly sevenfold over the period, but it's starting from a small base. And so even by the end, uh, it's still about a half percent of generation uh, by the end of the projection. Um, so clearly there's a lot of uh, policy drivers here. So your assumptions about future policy are key in understanding uh, the future of these renewable electricity generations. It's a key area of uncertainty. If uh, state level renewable portfolio standards were ended up being uh, more or less stringent than currently assumed, or if the production tax credit were extended, or if other tax credits were uh, reduced or expanded, uh, this could significantly change the outlook. This slide shows uh, electricity capacity additions. Um, the vast majority of projected electricity capacity additions are in natural gas and in non-hydro renewables. So what we have here on the left-hand side is capacity as it looked in 2009. And on the right-hand side, capacity additions. So you can see we've got installed uh, 1,000 gigawatts of electric ca power capacity and adding about another 220 cumulatively over the projection period. The uh, a combination, there's a couple key features that underpin uh, what kinds of capacity gets deployed here. It's a combination of low natural gas prices, uh, growing concerns about greenhouse gas emissions, which have uh, relative to past years significantly dampened interest in new coal capacity. All of the central station coal capacity that you see here, which is 14 gigawatts, is either 12 gigawatts of coal capacity that's already well under construction and will come online in the next couple years. There's also a couple gigawatts, about two gigawatts of clean coal power, which is induced by federal incentives for uh, clean coal power. Other than that, uh, there's some end use coal there, but there's, uh, those are, I think, very solid numbers. And beyond that, there's not much else in the outlook in terms of coal. Um, Another key change here is an increased estimate of nuclear power plants has reduced our assumption or our, our projection of nuclear additions by about two gigawatts. Uh, last year we had about eight gigawatts of new nuclear power. This year, uh, six gigawatts of nuclear power or roughly five plants. Again, this is uh, supported by uh, both the production tax credit uh, was part of the, I think, Energy Policy Act of 2005. We also, also have a loan guarantee program from nuclear power plants, which will support at least that much nuclear power. Turning now to uh, natural gas, which is one area where the outlook has changed most significantly, um, this is a chart showing the increase in shale gas production in trillion cubic feet per year uh, over the last decade. Um, it also indicates where that shale gas production is coming from and the place where this is. So key places, the Barnett Shale, uh, Fayetteville, and in recent years, a lot of attention to Marcellus and Haynesville. Um, this has been a very recent phenomena. Uh, by 2006, the gas industry had increasingly turned its attention to shale gas production. Um, this was due initially to high natural gas prices and to increases in techn technological improvements in hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling. Um, between 2006 and 2010, shale gas production grew on average by nearly 50% per year. Uh, drilling activity ha in turn has learned to the proving and booking of proved reserved. Um, U.S. natural gas reserves grew 11% last year overall. Shale gas reserves grew last year 76%. This was after a previous year where they had grown 50%. Um, this is at a time when natural gas prices were falling, which is usually a period of time when you'd see that reserves would tend to go down because they need to be uh, economically uh, 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 producible at current prices. So this is a dramatic change. Almost all of the increase in shale gas reserves is due to shale gas. Uh, we've got the full report of the change in reserves is on our, on our website. As a result of this, uh, pr you know, increased production, uh, proving of increased, uh, proving of gas reserves, um, EIA and other experts have increased their estimates of the technically recoverable natural gas resource base, which is a key factor that would underpin a long-term projection. As you gain experience with drilling, you prove up reserves, you learn more about the resource, uh, you get better information about what is actually there and technically recoverable with currently current technology. 
Um, so this shows the increase. One thing to pay attention to here, the, the time axis is not calendar time in a sense. What these are is different annual energy outlook additions. So it's what level of shale gas resources do we assume in different versions of the outlook. The actual physical resource base in the ground hasn't changed, but our assessment of what can be technically recoverable has changed. And so just in the last year, since last year's outlook, we've increased our shale gas resource estimate from 347 TCF to 821 TCF. So what's the effect of this on the outlook? It's big. Um, we're projecting a 30% increase in domestic gas production over this period uh, relative to about a 16% consumption growth. Production is growing higher, growing faster than consumption. Therefore, we have declining imports. So what we've got here is a chart. Uh, this is US dry gas production, a trillion cubic feet per year. Um, we've got last year's projections on here where there's the dashed lines, annual energy outlook 2010. And then we have the solid lines, which is this year's projection, annual energy outlook 2011. Uh, some, of the, some of the key differences here, first of all, we've got higher uh, consumption and production this year. Um, there was also a midterm, uh, near to midterm decline in the projection for natural gas last year. Um, this, the difference this year where you have natural gas uh, continually going up is roughly attributable to a couple things. One is lower uh, gas prices, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, the other is that we've changed our, our outlook for near-term expansion of renewable electricity generation. Um, there is a, a, a loan guarantee program for renewable electricity generation, which hasn't induced as much electricity, renewable electricity generation in the near term as we had been assuming, as, as, as many people uh, had uh, been assuming. And so uh, now that we have better information on that, we've adjusted the near-term outlook. And that's another key feature that underlies that near term. Let's uh, dig down into this a little bit more, look at the production side of natural gas. Uh, this graph uh, focuses on the supply side. Again, trillion cubic feet of dry gas production per year. Uh, this reinforces the importance of shale gas production within the US natural gas and broader energy mix uh, over time. Uh, it's projected to reach 12 trillion cubic feet of production by 2035, which is twice the level that we had in last year's outlook. Uh, shale gas uh, production increases dramatically and provides most of the domestic production increase in the annual energy outlook 2010. Um, in fact, if you look at the different components of uh, natural gas production, you have uh, gas production that's associated with oil production, coal bed methane and tight gas, uh, tight gas declining a little bit in the near term, but then pretty flat. You've got uh, non-associated offshore, pretty constant, maybe increasing a little bit toward the end non-associated onshore gas, uh, and the non-associated here is, means not associated with oil, uh, declining a bit. And then you could see at the top of this red line, you could think about that as all domestic production other than shale. And it's declining over the projection. So were it not for the significant increase in shale gas production, shale gas uh, both compensates for the decline in other US domestic gas production and goes beyond it to meet increased consumption needs and to actually squeeze out imports, which are primarily by pipeline from Canada. If we look at the natural gas uh, consumption side of the picture, uh, this I'll just show you quickly this slide showing how that's changing over time. Increased industrial gas production, increased production in electric power, as well as the commercial sector but the key areas of growth, industrial and electric power. So let's look at some, well, rather than focusing on that chart, let's look at some of the key drivers of this. Um, so this table is showing you some of the key drivers of gas consumption increase over the outlook in the various sectors. So a key driver in the industrial sector, and it's important to keep in mind here, here the industrial sector includes electricity production from combined heat and power. Okay, so if you're focused on over electricity generation, it's, it's a mix across the slide. So key sources of increase in natural gas consumption for industry, one is a very significant expansion of combined heat and power. Um, we also have a significant expansion of uh, gas intensive industry. As I mentioned earlier, both recovery from the economic downturn as well as uh, uh, significantly lower natural gas prices. In central electric power, uh, key things driving natural gas consumption increases include about a 30% increase in gas consumption. 
lower natural gas prices, which are offset by, uh, it, to some extent, by increased renewable generation and coal generation. Another key area of some growth is the commercial sector. Um, in the commercial sector, this is being driven by economic activity and in a significant increase in commercial floor space, but it's somewhat offset by an increase or a decrease in the energy intensity or an increase in the energy efficiency of uh, commercial facilities. Um, in contrast to the other sector, residential consumption is basically flat, while we've got significant expansion of the number of households and also the total square, importantly, the total square footage of residences in the United States, there's also a significant improvement in energy efficiency, which about exactly offsets this increase in service demand. So turning to natural gas prices, uh, the price projections are significantly lower than they were in last year's outlook. And last year's outlook was a decline from what it was in the previous year. So again, what you can see here, and this is in dollars uh, per million BTU, this is our uh, projection for the Henry Hub, uh, which is an important uh, benchmark for natural gas prices in North America. Uh, we see prices declining from what they were in the annual energy outlook 2009, which is the light blue line, uh, down to what they were in 2010, and you can see what they are in 2011. Uh, the natural gas price is still expected to rise over time as uh, natural gas production shifts away from the most productive sweet spots uh, particularly in shale gas production to less productive areas, uh, but the levels that those prices reach are significantly lower uh, than they have been in previous outlooks. Uh, this, as I mentioned earlier, is due to a couple things. One is an incorporation of our revised estimate for the technically recoverable natural gas or shale gas resource base, and it's also a revised methodology of natural gas price determination that better reflects the lessening of influence of oil prices on natural gas prices, which have become significantly decoupled over the last several years. The annual average natural gas price in the projection remains below $5 um, per MMBTU or per MCF. It's roughly, that's only about 3% difference. Uh, under $5 through about 2020, um, and then it increases further thereafter. Um, the reason for the uh, longer term uh, increase, again, is that as the shale gas resource base gets developed, you're gonna be uh, moving toward marginally less productive areas. At the same time, as the, as, uh, the shale gas industry expands, um, you're going to be needing to drill more wells. This will put increasing pressure on the drilling industry, which would tend to uh, drive costs up somewhat over time. But this is a very significant change in our price outlook for natural gas over the long term. Turning now to uh, oil and other liquid fuels, we'll first look at our uh, price projections. Uh, this slide shows uh, something that's roughly equivalent to something like a West Texas intermediate uh, oil price. It's the annual average price for low sulfur crude oil. Uh, one of the first things that might puzzle you when you look at this is that in, in uh, 2008, it gets up to $100 per barrel. Well, we know that oil prices at a point in time got up well above $100 per barrel. That's because this is an annual average, okay? Um, oil prices do con uh, continue to rise over the projection as the world economy recovers, as global demand for oil and other liquid fuels grow, and as supply increases face both below and above ground factors. Um, in 20, by 2035, the real price of crude oil in the reference case rises to about $125 per barrel in 2009 dollars. A number of supply and demand side assumptions underlie the reference case uh, oil price projections. Uh, one is that we assume that OPEC, OPEC maintains a roughly constant market share in the overall global uh, liquids market. Uh, it does rise slightly from about 40% currently to 42% over the outlook. Uh, the reference case oil price also assumes that there are continued limitations to economic access of oil development in resource-rich non-OPEC countries, um, and that this will restrain the growth of non-OPEC conventional liquids production. Um, there's also significant assumed demand growth underpinning the reference case oil price outlook. This is underpinned by global economic growth, which returns to an average of 3.5% year uh, per year annually, globally, um, much of which is in, emerg in emerging economies like uh, China, India, the Middle East, 
uh, where uh, transportation demands are not even close to being satiated. And so you have a significant degree of economic growth taking place in countries which have uh, significant potentially unmet needs for transportation services. Uh, there's clearly a significant uh, a degree of uncertainty uh, across uh, all energy prices, including oil prices. Uh, one could imagine alternative assumptions underpinning a, an oil price outlook. Uh, so what we do, and this will be uh, clear in the full annual energy outlook that we'll release in the spring, we'll be looking at a range of oil prices from a low that gets to only, uh, that's about $50 per barrel, in 2035 to a high oil price that gets up to $200 per barrel. By looking at this range of features which, with different underlying supply and demand assumptions, one can get a good sense of what the potential implications could be of alternative oil prices looking forward. Uh, this is uh, one other uh, global slide which shows the underlying assumptions about where, this, uh, liquids is com where these liquids are coming from in the future. Uh, while unconventional liquids uh, more than triple globally in our projections, conventional petroleum supplies still, or conventional petroleum supplies still continue to comprise uh, the ma majority of liquid supply. Um, our projections of total global liquids consumption in the annual energy outlook rise to about 111 million barrels per day by 2035. Um, this is due to strong growth in China, India, uh, the Middle East and other developing nations, out, primarily outside of the OECD. Uh, again, assume, assumes constraints to non-OPEC conventional supply uh, will necessitate increased, increased uh, production from OPEC members and from unconventional sources. Um, the growth in the conventional OPEC sources is primarily from Saudi Arabia and Iraq. Uh, key sources of non-OPEC conventional supplies is growth in Brazil, Russia, Kazakhstan and the United States. Um, when it comes to unconventional, in the uh, non-OPEC countries, this includes Canadian oil sands. It includes biofuels from the United States and Brazil. Um, when it comes to OPEC's unconventionals, this is primary, primarily <coughs> Venezuelan extra heavy, crude, and it's a gas to liquids from Qatar. We'll have uh, much more detail on uh, the underlying uh, global oil supply and demand outlook as part of our international energy outlook, which will also come out in the spring. Focusing back on the United States, uh, this is a, a figure showing from 1970 to the present and then out to 2035, uh, U.S. liquids fuel consumption in millions of barrels per day. Uh, I'm going to turn to another slide in a moment. What I, main thing I want you to get out of this slide is the petroleum versus the other part. So up until the, the dark blue line, so the light blue, the green, and the dark blue is the part of the uh, liquid fuels mix that you typically think of as petroleum. It includes crude oil, both imports and domestically produced, and it also includes uh, natural gas plant liquids, which are separated uh, during the, the uh, processing of natural gas to create dry gas. Uh, what this is showing is that um, after an initial return and recovery from the economic downturn, uh, the outlook for petroleum liquid su uh, supply in the United States is, is pretty much flat in the outlook. Uh, nonetheless, there is a projected increase in the overall consumption of liquid fuels, and that increase is met uh, by biofuels, which are coming in in large part due to the uh, renewable fuel standard. This digs a little bit deeper into that outlook for liquid fuels. A uh, number of different points I want to make here. Uh, it's the increased use of biofuels, which uh, you can see is the second bar from the bottom there. Again, this is millions of barrels per day. What we're showing here is uh, what the level was in 2009 and what the projection is for 2035. And so comparing the uh, size of the bars, you can see whether something's increasing and decreasing and by how much we've got millions of barrels per day on the bottom there. Um, ethanol use uh, of all types more than doubles over the projection, growing from about 11 billion gallons in 2009 to 21 billion gallons in 22, and nearly 28 billion gallons uh, by 2035. By the end of the projection, ethanol represents about 18% of total gas consumption by volume. Um, e E85, or an 85% blend of ethanol, uh, increases rapidly in the later years of the projection in order to meet the renewable fuel standard. Um, if you think about where the ethanol is going, 
Uh, there's three places it can go at this point. It can, go, it can be blended uh, E85 and used in a flex fuel vehicle. It can be blended E10, 10% ethanol, which is what we do with most of our, almost all of our ethanol right now. Um, but now, since EPA has issued a waiver, you can blend 15% ethanol into gasoline. So if you look at the outlook, by the time you get to the end of the outlook, uh, and you ask the question, where is the ethanol going? How is it being used? It's roughly speaking about a third, a third, a third. So about a third of it ends up getting used in E10, about a third in E15, and about a third in E85 combined with a flex fuel vehicle. Uh, U.S. crude oil production also increases somewhat in the outlook. Uh, this is uh, primarily over the next uh, decade or so, and it's a result of continued drilling in oil shale formations, as well as increased use of enhanced oil recovery using CO2 onshore. Um, one final point in this slide, you do see a, a pretty substantial increase in natural gas plants liquids, which goes hand in hand with our uh, in, uh, increased uh, projections for natural gas uh, production and consumption. Overall, then, you can see this increased domestic production leads to declining imports. So focusing a moment on uh, biofuels, this slide shows the uh, different legislative targets for the renewable fuel standard and what we're projecting over time. So this is, um, got to be a little bit careful with the units here. This is billions of gallons, but these are ethanol equivalent gallons. And so for the, uh, for the highly motivated policy wonks of you, these are like RINs within the, uh, the renewable fuel standard system. Okay, a little bit different from, you can think of it roughly as a heat equivalent gallon, but then you have to adjust for credits because there's extra bonuses for different kinds of fuels. In any event, um, the main message I want you to take away from this is that we see the level in uh, 2009, the yellow here, uh, the bright yellow is uh, corn ethanol that will be increasing over time, but under the renewable fuel standard, only up to 15 billion uh, gallons of corn ethanol uh, can qualify. And beyond that, you need to have uh, advanced biofuels. So what we do see is that in short order, we're already quite close to uh, 15 billion gallons of ethanol, so that can be uh, readily achieved. Uh, the legislative target for 2022 is 36 billion gallons. Now, EPA has the authority to um, issue waivers if, in fact, the production uh, capability is not there to achieve the standard. Um, this is particularly an issue with regard to advanced biofuels in recent years, particularly uh, cellulosic ethanol, which has not um, uh, developed as quickly as, as people had hoped. And so EPA has, in fact, had to at issue waivers in the last couple of years uh, for the uh, cellulosic or advanced biofuel target. So what we find in the outlook is that uh, that is assumed to be necessary in the outlook. So the legislative target is not met by uh, 2022, but it is met by the end of the projection period. Uh, some of the key issues with uh, the cellulosic ethanol is that there have been uh, financial and technological hurdles, hurdles which have delayed the, uh, many of the planned uh, advanced biofuels projects. Uh, turning now to light duty fuel economy, another key feature of the outlook for liquid fuel consumption. Um, there's a number of different regulatory standards which are relevant when thinking about uh, the mile per gallon achievement in the light duty vehicle fleet. Uh, to be clear about what the reference case uh, includes, it does include the adoption of uh, fuel economy standards uh, for model year 2011 as well as uh, through 20, uh, the year 2016. So this would uh, the, lead, the regulatory target there is a little bit over 34 miles per gallon uh, for the CAFE average. There's also a, a statutory mandate to get uh, the level of MPG up to 35 miles per gallon by 2020, so that's also in the outlook. Um, to be clear, the outlook does not assume uh, proposals which are, are planned to come out in September 2011. We'll have to see how that develops and then uh, explore that further. At, but at this point, uh, by the end of the outlook, miles per gallon uh, does get up to 20, 30, uh, gets up to 38 miles per gallon. Uh, this next figure shows uh, that most of the increased demand for uh, transport fuels or for, is in um, light and heavy duty vehicles as opposed to other sources like uh, marine, air, and rail. Uh, transportation's share of, li of liquid fuels demand remains at a, just over 70% uh, over the projection period. Uh, highway vehicles 
uh, account for 80% of transportation liquid fuel consumption, and light duty vehicles alone account for over 60%. So these are key features in the projection for transportation fuel consumption. In terms of what is driving this, uh, this table shows uh, the key drivers uh, for light duty vehicles. We've got increased uh, vehicle miles traveled. We've got an increased number of licensed driver. We've got a, 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 a fairly significant increase in the miles per licensed driver. This tends to drive uh, the demand for transportation fuels up. But however, that is somewhat moderated by an increase in the fuel efficiency of the vehicle stock, which drives uh, fuel consumption down relative to what it otherwise would be. On the heavy duty side, uh, the key driver here is industrial output, uh, which over this period grows by 61% uh, manufacturing output, which is a very key driver of uh, fuel consumption in heavy duty vehicles, which goes up 47%. Again, this is somewhat moderated by uh, increased uh, efficiency of vehicles. This next figure is showing you the annual sales of light car and trucks, uh, both in 2000, the year 2009, um, but then into the projection period. So a typical year, uh, you might sell about 17 million light duty vehicles per year. You can see in 2009, due to the recession, that was much lower. We see that increasing back up to normal levels over the next decade or so, and then increasing uh, further thereafter. Uh, the gray part here is uh, what you can think of as con conventional uh, combustion engines, uh, conventional gasoline engines. Uh, the other part with the colors is uh, so-called unconventional light duty vehicles. By the end of the projection, over 40% of sales end up being in unconventional vehicles. Now, this is largely, as you can see with the yellow, or I mean the orange, it's largely E85 flex fuel vehicles. In the early year, this is induced in part by credits which are available under the corporate average fuel economy system for flex fuel vehicles. In the latter parts of the projection, those are assumed to phase out as they are under current law. Uh, but then you have the renewable fuel standard driving the need for E85 vehicles. Because as I mentioned again, there's only so much ethanol you can blend into E10 and E15. Beyond that, you need to put in E85. If you have E85 available, you need to have vehicles to use the E85. And so what we're assuming here is that uh, E85 will be price competitive and will be slightly favorable, which would induce people to want to have flex fuel vehicles in the outer years. Um, hybrid electric and diesel vehicles uh, each increased over 5% market share by the end of the projection. And plug-in electric vehicles, including uh, both plug-in hybrids and all electric vehicles, uh, grow to 3% of sales by the end of the projection. The, uh, I'm just about done here, and, and I'm, I'm going to be happy to turn to questions. Uh, one thing I want to mention before we take questions, though, is our annual energy conference, which, as you can see down here at the bottom, is April 26th and 27th. So put this on your calendar. We've got a link up here, eia.gov slash conference slash 2011. Uh, this will be at the Ronald Reagan Center, in addition to a number of uh, Many interesting sessions that we're developing will have a lot of results from the full annual energy outlook that will also be ready to discuss there in all aspects of the energy system. Uh, so thank you very much for the opportunity to speak, and I'm happy to uh, take questions and have discussion. Thank you very much. So please. Um, Raise your hands and identify the institution that you represent. Uh, a hand up there. Sure. Hi, I'm Ken Meyercourt. Uh, I'm representing World Docs. Looking at your graph 30, um, you show uh, global liquids production more or less peaking in 2005, and, uh, plateauing for the last few years, then declining last year which is pretty much exactly what the peak oil theorists have been predicting for a decade. If rather than your rosy projections, we see uh, global liquids production decline by say 2% a year, year after year, how many years would that take before you decided that global liquids production has peaked? Okay, so I think you referred to slide 30, which does not have global liquids production peaking 
it actually has it significantly expanding from its current level up to 111 million barrels per day. Did I, did I misunderstand the question? Or? No, that's your projection. I see. What if the reality is a decline of, say, 2% year after year in the future? How many many years will it take before you all decide that global liquid production has peaked? I see. I understand your question. So, so you're... Uh, Associating the, the current decline or the recent decline in global liquids production as due to the, which I would attribute to the economic downturn as being a long lasting feature, which would be more of a resource supply constraint. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah. So I, w I guess I would repeat that. I, I would attribute the recent decline to, uh, to an economic phenomena. We've been in a significant uh, global downturn over the last several years, which has reduced the demand. Uh, for global liquids and production has uh, declined in turn. In fact, there's a significant degree of uh, spare, spare capacity available up to 5 million barrels per day, which is currently not being used, which uh, would be available if it was needed. Um, you know, looking forward, uh, we see the, uh, we do have increased oil prices in the projection. Uh, this is a combination of uh, increased global demand for liquids. Uh, some uh, resource constraints due to both above ground factors, which is, has to do with economic access. Uh, you are moving toward uh, sources of oil, a greater use of unconventional sources, which are more expensive to produce. Uh, but in terms of the availability of the hydrocarbon uh, liquids resource base, we don't see that being a limiting feature of the outlook through at least the year 2035. I think as, you know, as the future unfolds and we see changes in, you know, global energy production and consumption, we'll assess that new information as it comes out, of course. Thanks. So, uh, we've got Professor Duran, Chuck, and we've got a hand in front. Uh, Hopkins, uh, <coughs> Sice. Uh, my question is, what, uh, what are your assumptions about imports of, uh, of oil from the oil sands, from the Canadian oil sands over this period of time? Uh, yeah. Well, we have, uh, we don't have what I would say is explicit assumptions about imports of the oil sands, for example, to the United States or to other countries, uh, but we do have uh, significant expansion of oil sands development in the outlook. It gets up to about 5 million barrels per day, if I recall, by the year 2035, a very significant expansion from where it currently is. In terms of uh, where that uh, oil would flow in terms of the global balance, uh, that depends on uh, the needs of different countries. You know, uh, uh, you know, the United States is close to Canada, so the United States would be uh, kind of an obvious place for that additional oil production to flow. Um, there are existing pipelines in place that could carry uh, some of that. If, in fact, it got that high, there'd probably need to be additional pipelines. But in terms of the uh, level of detail in the projection, uh, you know, global oil uh, supply and demand is, tends to be balanced globally. Oil tends to move around the world depending upon uh, the, you know, supply and demand at different in different localities. And so, does that answer the question? Well, we're the principal supplier. There's no other alternative at this point. They can't, they can't, uh, they can't send uh, out over the mountains because they don't have permits for it. They're right. Pipelines. So, uh, first of all, the, the numbers I was referring to are, are long-term projections, and certainly over the course of a couple decades, there could potentially be a, a alternative outlets than the United States. Uh, there, there are proposals for pipelines that would go to the West Coast and could be exported to uh, Asia, other parts of the world. Well, I guess we'll have to see how that develops. Thank you. There's a, a hand up in front, and then uh, Professor Cole. Thank you. I'm, I'm Greg Smith with Community Research for a local nonprofit. I'd like to come back to that first question and expand on it. Um, the uh, IEA, Plan, is, is saying now that global oil production peaked in 2006 and we've been on a plateau since, and they project that production from existing fields will go into decline very soon. And the way we stay, uh, maintain current production is through largely through undiscovered or untapped fields. You've got an increase of 37% roughly in production and a doubling in price. And I think we still have to ask, what if that's wrong and why does the EIA, um, what, what are the differing assumptions between the EIA's projections and the IEA's? And then expanding on that, your natural gas production, especially for shale gas, depends largely on unproved fields. Massive assumption right there. What if you're wrong? What happens to our prices? 
what happens to our economic engine. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so there's a number of parts of that. Uh, one, in terms of you have to be quite careful now in, in, in comparing the outlook in the world energy outlook, which comes from the International Energy Agency, and the annual energy outlook, which I present, just presented from EIA. Um, one key difference at this point is that the focus of the central scenario that they have focused on in that outlook is a, uh, a new policy scenario, uh, which is different from our reference case, which you could think of as their current policy scenario. If you compare our <coughs> reference case, which I've just presented, to their current policy scenario, uh, the outlook for global oil supply demand prices is, is very similar. Uh, so I think if you compare apples to apples there, you'll see quite similar uh, results. In terms of the question about undiscovered reserves, at any point in time throughout history, as well as into our outlook, if you look in terms of what can fields that are currently producing, how much will they produce, versus how much of the future depends on stuff that hasn't yet been drilled or developed. It's always going to look like a decline from what is currently being produced, and new stuff comes online. Um, but what you see throughout history is that the new stuff does come online, assuming that market prices are sufficient to induce that to happen. And in our outlook, it uh, compensates for declines in existing fields and, in fact, can go beyond that and grow further. Uh, we've got uh, Professor Cole from SAIS, and then I have a hand up there in the back. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Richard, for your very comprehensive presentation. Uh, my question relates to nuclear power. Uh, your U.S. outlook is, is not very robust, and I'm wondering if uh, it is tied particularly to the number of loan guarantees available, and if so, which number are you assuming? I mean, there was, were a few in the 05 Act, but the, I think the administration's requesting more, but I'm not sure that's been acted on by Congress. Uh, and how does this year's outlook compare with last year on, on nuclear power? Yes. Uh, so, so there's about, uh, there's six gigawatts of new uh, nuclear capacity that comes online uh, between 2009 and 2035. Uh, last year there was about eight, so it's about two gigawatts less than it was last year. Uh, there's also some uprates of existing capacity. I think it's four gigawatts. Is that correct? Three? Three gigawatts of uh, new of uprates of existing capacity. So it's, I think it's the six that you're focused on, and you're asking what's driving that and how has it changed. Um, there's a couple key things that entered it. It's not just the loan guarantees. It's the loan guarantees in conjunction with production tax credits, which are also quite important in uh, uh, incentivizing new nuclear power builds. But basically beyond really what is roughly covered by the, um, uh, the tax credits and the existing loan guarantees, there's not much projection beyond that. So this does not as assume a significant expansion of the uh, nuclear loan guarantee program. Thank you. There's a hand up in the back here, and then I'm two here and one here. So go ahead. Thank you very much. My name is Friedo Siedemann. I'm with the German Embassy. I have a question uh, regarding the, uh, your prognosis regarding the CO2 emissions, because just uh, two weeks ago, the, the uh, American delegation in Cancun uh, reiterated its commitment to reduce carbon emissions by 17 percent until, until 2020, and they asserted that uh, that would be possible without uh, laws to be changed or on the basis of the present laws. So the question is, have you taken this into account to some extent, or did you not take into account because this is just policy uh, and, and not uh, a law that has been changed? Right. Uh, so the, the basis for the, the reference case, again, is uh, what's currently in laws and regulations. And this is important because, and, and one distinction that may be made here is that there are existing laws um, that one might imagine developing specific regulations under that could have in effects on greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, we already have a greenhouse gas tailpipe standard for automobiles, which is in part under the Clean Air Act. And so that is represented in our outlook. If one imagined applying the same approach to other aspects of the energy system, one could get additional greenhouse gas reductions under existing statute. Um, but we don't, when it comes to aspects of statute for, for which the actual regulatory 
apparatus that implements that is highly important as it wouldn't be in this case. We do not include that in the reference case until there's sufficient specificity of those regulations to include it. And at this point, that's not the case for uh, things other than the greenhouse gas tailpipe standard. But that could change over the next several years and we'll have, you know, w when it does get sufficient specificity and becomes toward a final regulation, it would be the kind of thing we'd in include. Thank you. There is a hand up here and uh, there and then in the front. Uh, uh, Richard, just a, a time check here. Um, you have to leave around 5 of 11, roughly? Sounds, yeah, sounds yeah? good. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm Joel Darmstadter from RFF. Let me extend the uh, discussion or dialogue, uh, beginning with uh, the question a moment ago. Uh, Richard, you mentioned that in addition to the reference case, uh, you made its debut today, and then the, sens the other sensitivity cases that will come out in the spring, you do from time to time respond to specific uh, mandates or, re or requests from congressional committees or, or members of Congress for uh, uh, calculating the consequences of specific assumptions that are not uh, either uh, embodied in the reference case or in the other sensitive e sensitivity cases. And one of them from time to time, if my memory serves, is to look at the implications of a more aggressive uh, emission reduction a regime that the United States may adopt in, in policies. So the question is, uh, has there been a recent such request, I mean in the last six months or in the last year, uh, that would have uh, uh, obliged you to do such an analysis of the implications and what would have been or what were uh, the consequences for the reference case uh, then operative? Yes, uh, so you're absolutely right. We, we have been asked, uh, EIA has been asked by Congress on any number of occasions to evaluate a number of different types of energy policies. Uh, comprehensive energy and climate policy is one of those. Uh, the, last, one, the last report that we uh, presented was, I believe, the Waxman-Markey legislation, H.R. 2454, is that right? Or do we have one after that? Kerry Lieberman. Lieberman, yes. Kerry Lieberman, sorry. So uh, we've been doing a lot of those over the last, several, uh, last couple of years. And uh, what one does see, and this is relevant to the, the other gentleman's uh, question, uh, a, a significant uh, you know, uh, reduction in, in uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the economy. Of course, this depends on the design of any particular legislative proposal. Uh, what one finds is that the electricity sector tends to play a, 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 a very significant role in where those reductions come from relative to, for example, uh, transportation or, or industry. Uh, but uh, did that answer the question? Feedback, so, effects, on <laughs> feedback effects on GDP. So uh, the, the interrelationship of, of energy in the broader economy is... Uh, Complex. They're obviously very closely intertwined, as you know, as we've seen through the presentation. Um, the overall impact on GDP that one sees from uh, the types of legislative proposals that have have been proposed um, in the grand scheme of things tends to be uh, quite small in percentage terms. In, in the analyses that we've done and the legislative proposals we've analyzed, well less than uh, one one percent of GDP cumulatively over time. Uh, from these policies. Now that's one way of looking at it. It's a very small and like a, a fraction of a percent. Um, measured in dollars, it could be measured in billions and billions of dollars. So depending upon your perspective and the metric you use, uh, it can look big or small, but certainly as a proportion of GDP, uh, we don't see that being a, 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 what most people would probably think of as a huge impact over time. That doesn't mean it's not a big impact on the energy system. Uh, there's a hand up here and then uh Second, and then a person sitting in the front. Good morning. My name is Christopher Krauss from the National Environmental Education Foundation. Um, on slide 36 um, that deals with um, light-duty vehicles and heavy-duty vehicles, um, you have miles per license driver rising from 2009 to, 230, uh, to 2035 on the light-duty vehicles and declining on the heavy-duty vehicles. I was just curious if you could maybe elaborate a little bit on what your assumptions were for the rises and falls. And right. Uh, I thought somebody might ask that question. So what we see is a very significant expansion in the number of freight trucks there, and that each truck is dri being driven somewhat less. Um, I will, do I have a, do you have a quick answer to that, John? What's 
sorry about that. Uh, what's going on there on the, with respect to the heavy trucks is there's some structural shifts going on in the economy and the types of trucks that are used to haul some of that freight and, and those impacts are getting played out here where there's a, a lower per vehicle usage rate but the, the types of trucks needed uh, more of the medium sized trucks for more of a service type economy that, that's being picked up there. And then what's going on with the increase in licensed drivers is just that as the uh, economy recovers and grows, so does the, the demand for travel, personal travel. The overall, amount of, the overall amount of vehicles miles traveled in heavy trucks is going up very considerably there, you can see, though, because you have to couple the number of trucks and the miles per truck. Um, I'm, I'm going to be a little uh, strict on uh, time for each question because we have about five minutes left. But I know Mr. Nagano-san from uh, Tokyo Electric Power Company had his hand up for a while, so I'm sorry. Take him next. Thank you very much. I have one, just one question uh, regarding the page 27, the natural gas price projection. The, as the graph shows, the, the gas price has fluctuated very much in the past. And uh, of course, this is a longer term uh, projection, but I think there is some certain uh, fluctuation. Uh, what do you think about the range? Is that the, such of the fluctuation range will be reduced by the increase in the shale gas or uh, ignore some uh, <coughs> such a range, a fluctuation? That's it. Yeah. Thank you. So you have drawn an important distinction between uh, you know, day to day or week to week or month to month or even annual fluctuations versus, you know, a long term uh, trend, which is what you should think of our projections. Uh, so there is, a, you know, there's a significant uh, volatility to both natural gases as well as oil and other energy prices as well. Um, the I take your specific question, you know, first, uh, we do find that the uh, production of shale gas and the increased shale gas resource base has moderated natural gas prices in the sense that our long-term projection has come down very significantly. I mean, over the last year, we've seen the effect of shale gas production on near-term prices. We've seen continued production and production growth even at a time when prices were low. This would tend to hold prices down from where they otherwise might be. You know, there's a number of different reasons for that which we could get into. In terms of the ability of shale to uh, lower the overall volatility of prices, which I think was your ultimate question. Um, there are hypotheses that that could be the case. We'll have to see how that plays over time. You know, one argument that I've heard is that the ability to, um, first of all, you know, ramp up and down shale gas production more quickly than you can conventional gas production is one argument, which uh, may be compelling. We'll see how that, that plays out. Um, you can uh, stop completions of wells. You can uh, much more quickly start. Uh, shale gas production is much more like a manufacturing process, which you can start up and slow down. The discovery process isn't nearly as probabilistic as it is for uh, conventional gas production. So there are some reasons that one might think that's the case. We'll have to see how that happens over time. Thanks. So there's a hand up here and then a hand in front. Uh, hi, Mark Hudson, uh, George Washington University. Um, I noticed on slide 17, um, in terms of the overnight capital costs, uh, you mentioned there was a report from SAIC that basically reduced uh, solar PV by 25%. I was wondering if that was, uh, if you had any information about whether that was spe identifying specific technologies that were becoming cheaper or if that was sort of a replacement or if there was any sort of insight you could give us on that? Right. So there, there is a, a, a detailed report, which, you know, I'll, I'll definitely direct you to that because that'll give you all of the underlying assumptions. They were quite careful about uh, being consistent across uh, different types of uh, electrical power uh, capital in terms of the definition of what the plant is. Very careful about what kinds of uh, PV or solar thermal you're talking about. You can find that all in there. In terms of the photovoltaics, I mean, we have seen a significant reduction uh, over the last couple of years in terms of uh, cost of PV. There's been significant expansion of uh, capacity. At the same time, we had the economic downturn. And so uh, those costs have come down significantly. The other thing I had mentioned was uh, the definition of the type of uh, plant that has been analyzed has changed somewhat. And so it's assumed to be a larger plant than had been assumed last year. Thanks. And then a question here. Uh, Hussein Ibn Yusuf, International yeah. Petroleum Enterprises. Uh, you talked about uh, natural gas extensively. Uh, availability is much better. Affordability is great. Uh, there's security of supply there. 
And also you talked about decoupling uh, of uh, prices between oil and gas. And yet, um, on slide 26, I believe it is, uh, 25, the role of uh, gas in the transportation sector has really not changed. It's not a new technology. CNG has been around for, for years. Uh, why don't we see a substantial increase in the use of natural gas in the transportation sector? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that question. So th there is uh, some increased use of natural gas vehicles uh, in the projection, but it's, it's not sizable, as I, as I think you point out. It gets into the tens of thousands of vehicles uh, per year as opposed to, to millions. Um, primarily, the, the places where one has seen penetration of natural gas has been into kind of mid-duty trucks, so local fleets where you can uh, centrally refuel them. So a key issue here with natural gas and vehicles is the availability of refueling stations. Uh, there's range, range issues, and so if you're coming back to the same point, and if you have a fleet of cars that are coming back to the same point, it's quite, uh, could be uh, economically uh, sensible and uh, operationalizable to have a natural gas fleet. And so we actually have seen that. Now, from a pure uh, uh, cost competitiveness point of view, given the price of natural gas, you know, relative to the incremental costs, that, that can make sense. There's also been, um, you know, some inducement uh, from government policy to, toward natural gas vehicles, so that's another reason that one sees it. Over the long run, the reason that there isn't more significant penetration is some of those key hurdles, which is, uh, you know, whether there'll be availability of refueling station, there's issues with guard to range, there are higher upfront capital costs uh, for natural gas vehicles, which tends to weigh heavily in uh, folks who are, have, may have a near-term time frame to these kinds of decisions. Um, there's also issues with regard to resale. So if you're, if you're, you may immediately think that the natural gas vehicle makes sense for you, but if you're not sure that you could recoup that if you went to resell a vehicle, that's another issue that tends to impede it. So, but this is something that um, could change. There's certainly been a lot of policy interest in natural gas vehicles. Um, in last year's outlook, we did some sensitivity cases that looked at uh, different alternative possibilities for natural gas vehicles. And depending upon the assumptions, both about policy as well as the kind of broader market behavior about the, the willingness and interest in adopting this, uh, you can get significantly different results. So I would point you to the last year's outlook. Just, just taking advantage of my, yes, <laughs> yeah. my seat here, Richard. Uh, this is a composite of some of the questions that have been raised, which is, the, is EIA planning um, perhaps an aggressive policy scenario along the lines of the new policy scenario in the IEA that would reflect some of the questions, but also a more aggressive substitution and a repowering of coal plants um, by natural gas uh, over the next, over this period, over the next 20 years. Because there seemed to be a lot of interest uh, in some of the uh, senators from coal states in beginning having uh, co-firing of coal with natural gas and biomass. Uh, anyway, just, just the question is, are you, are you thinking yeah. about a new policy scenario that would be more aggressive across the different sectors? So there's a number of different alternative scenarios which have a heavy policy component to them uh, that we did last year and, and we'll uh, do similar and potentially different ones this year as well. Uh, we've done what we call the extended policy scenarios, which is things like the production tax credit for wind or ethanol tax credits or corporate average fuel economy standards, looking at scenarios where those uh, continue to either stay in place or increase into the future as they've done in the past. So this is one type of scenario. Um, as was discussed earlier, we do uh, uh, often get asked by Congress to evaluate specific legislative proposals. And in the context of our issues and focus section of the full annual, annual, annual energy outlook, we do tend to look at uh, different um, uh, policy proposals which are either far along in the regulatory process, which could have significant impacts. Those are the kinds of things we tend to look at. Um, potentially, if there's legislative proposals that um, seem like they have uh, legs and people are very interested in understanding the impact of the energy system. Those are the kinds of things that we would analyze in the issues and focus section of our annual energy outlook. Great. Well, I want to congratulate you on a true tour de force <laughs> in terms of the energy, annual energy outlook and I'd like to uh, uh, invite you back again in April and next year. Thanks, Thanks very, very much. much, David. Appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> In contrast to uh, several people. Right, yeah, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <Appreciate that. laughs> sure. Uh, it's, you know, we do, 
we don't have an exact date yet. It'll be certainly by the EIA conference. Uh, it's it's typically come out in March, uh, but it'll be March or April, somewhere there. We do that every single year. Yeah, it's always always December for the reference case because we have to do that first, uh, and then we do all the alternative sensitivity cases kind of around that. And since we are done with the reference case around this time of year, it doesn't make sense to kind of hold that back. Yeah, we'll do that. Well, the, well, the IEA's new policy scenario is a global scenario, and so we won't be doing something that because this is not a uh, an international outlook. And so, but, right. But you could think of our uh, our extended policy scenario. I'm gonna fall down here.